Voy a traer el café. Buenos días a todos y a todas. Eh, les agradecemos mucho el que hayan respondido a esta invitación nuestra a nombre de la Escuela Graduada de Ciencia y Tecnología de la Información del Recinto de Río Piedras de la Universidad de Puerto Rico. Les damos la bienvenida. Para los que no me conocen, pues mi nombre es José Sánchez Lugo, yo soy el director de la Escuela de Ciencia y Tecnología de Información y me da mucho gusto eh, el recibirlos en la mañana de hoy. Eh, para nosotros constituye eh, motivo de, de gran alegría también eh, contar con la participación de la doctora Carol Tenoti, eh, de nuestra solidaria eh, Universidad de Tennessee en Knoxville, con quien tenemos una muy buena relación. Eh, para hablar sobre estos temas que entendemos son fundamentales, sobre todo en esta época en que todo hay que demostrar, todo hay que evidenciarlo y todo hay que justificarlo, sobre todo cuando hay dinero envuelto. Así que es una de, la, de esas áreas que son fundamentales para la ejecución tanto de no solamente los que dirigen la biblioteca, sino todos los que de una u otra forma estamos vinculados a estas. Un poco de trasfondo de la doctora Tenopil, es catedrática destacada en el programa de comunicación y ciencia de información de la Universidad de Tennessee en Knoxville. Los que llevan un tiempo en este campo han estado escuchando por este, este nombre por, por mucho tiempo porque es una de las investigadoras eh, más prolíficas en términos de lo que tiene que ver tanto con el área de assessment, del valor de las bibliotecas, como de otras áreas eh, de su especialidad. Eh, la doctora Tenopil tiene su, es autora de cinco libros, eh, su trabajo eh, ha sido premiado por la Asociación eh, Internacional de, Inform de Ciencia de Información y Tecnología, entre otros eh, destacadas eh, reconocimientos. Lleva, no voy a decir cuántos años, lleva muchos años eh, trabajando en este campo eh, y con, con mucha eh, generosidad aceptó a estar con nosotros eh, hoy y mañana compartiendo su experiencia y compartiendo lo que se ha levantado en este proyecto. Eh, ahora voy a hablar en inglés para darle la bienvenida. We'd like to welcome Dr. Carol Tenopir. I was just telling them good things about you. Uh, for us, it's very, uh, it's a very, it's an honor and, uh, and we, we rejoice in the possibility of having her with us today and tomorrow, uh, sharing her experience, sharing her uh, knowledge, um, on, not only on the, the value of uh, libraries, something that we all know how valuable they are, but the how to demonstrate, how to evidence, how to share that information with others that are the ones that sometimes make decisions that not always are based on, uh, on true and uh, evident information and data. Uh, this, this project, the Lead Value Project, has been uh, documented in, in articles, in talks, presentations, and we wanted uh, Dr. Tenopi to share with us uh, her experience and her uh, knowledge on this particular area today. Tomorrow, tomorrow we'll have a different uh, presentation uh, with other interests, but today we would like to welcome Dr. Tenopir on this uh, the Lead Value Project Lessons Learned and the possibility to replicate these studies. Thank you. Thank you so much, and I am I'm really pleased to be here. I was trying to think. The last time I was here, I think was about six years ago, maybe five or six, but the timing of this 
this visit is excellent because we have unprecedented ice and snow in Tennessee and I am so glad to get out of there. We've had two weeks. The university was closed a couple days last week and the week before because we couldn't get out of our houses because uh, like most people in, in the South, I don't know how to drive if it's icy and snowy. So anyway, thank you for many reasons for inviting me and for the timing is, is really um, excellent. Um, I'm going to describe the Live Value Project and, and give you a, a kind of a, an overview of it, but um, also talk about types of assessment and motivations for assessment in, in the library context. This project was done in conjunction with the Association of Research Libraries and many university library partners, uh, large and small. We had, um, in the US, it was funded by Institute of Museum and Library Services, but we also had uh, a partner in uh, the United Kingdom, uh, JISC Collections. They partnered in just the value of collections part. And we also had participation in Australia, so it really is a, an interesting project that kind of, um, that grew as we did it and, and new libraries came in and, and asked if they could help replicate. And the, um, the, the, the overall purpose and the main reason is to, is really a research project to look at multiple ways to measure value, lots from lots of different perspectives and to ultimately create a toolkit or um, a, a, a database of methods and, um, and findings from libraries that have tested those methods. So many of you may be familiar with um, a concurrent effort by uh, the Association of College and Research Libraries. And their main purpose was to, was to update their standards, their standards for assessment very different purpose. We, we, we talked to each other, we, we, we worked together, but ARL and ACRL were partners on the two things and they were trying to develop standards that libraries would follow. We, we were developing tested methods and the idea that if you're gonna, gonna have to follow standards or you're going to be demonstrating methods, let's see what other libraries have done and what kinds of methods they've used and give some ideas. So it's really idea generating and, and giving you a whole range of things to choose from. The motivation for all of these studies um, that came up about the same time in assessment was this idea that we know the value of academic libraries and that value has long been assumed. We didn't used to have to demonstrate it quite so much. Um, I think we know that, that our collections and, and our services, our portals, and our web guides, and our classes, and our e-collections, and our print collections are the heart of the university, have, have value to our students, our faculty, our researchers, our, um, our teachers. But um, in an era of steady state or decreasing budgets, combined with the Competition, I guess, is the word I might use, combined with a range of choices of places to get information, sometimes that value is not recognized as it should be. So libraries uh, everywhere are, are faced with the, the necessity of measuring in multiple ways the value of what libraries do and presenting that in ways that are meaningful to the funders at our particular institution. And it's not just, assessment is not just about showing that what you do is good. You know, I know it's good and I'm gonna show you <laughs> it's good. That's not the only reason for assessment. There, the other reason for assessment is choosing from among possibilities. There are so many choices in academic libraries and sometimes when you make a choice, you have to give something up. So if you're going to add research data services in support of your researchers, do you just add that on to everything you do, um, assuming your budget is not going to increase, or do you make a choice to not offer something or to, or to decrease, de decrease services in another area? So it's a matter of demonstrating value of what you do, but it's also a matter of gathering information that will help make decisions into the future in terms of, of priorities of services or new services. 
Um, and so I, these are the kinds of things that, that we're going to look at today. Um, I'm going to focus um, today, we're going to have really basically three parts uh, of today's presentation. The first, is, uh, the first two, I'm going to uh, define values. I'm going to back up a little bit and look at the kinds of values that we, um, that we were developing methods and testing methods for in the library information context. So we'll look at some, library, some definitions that fit within the library of what kinds of value uh, can be measured. And within that, and, and expanding from that, I'm going to give you a pro, uh, an overview of the, the value project. Um, most of my examples and the methods I'm talking about come from one of the teams that I led in this project. This was a very big project with lots of teams, and that has to do with collections. Um, but, but we didn't look just at collections, but most of my examples will come from that. But, um, but certainly the, you will find that we, we tested uh, multiple things, and, and most of the methods would apply beyond collections. Um, after that, we'll pause, have time for, for questions, and then I'm going to, the replication possibilities, I'm going to turn it over to you. So as, as time remains, because we, we've got a good, good hour and a half now, as time remains, what I'd like you to do then is think about your own context, because assessment is contextual. What works for one academic library does not work for another. So I want to, to have, you have time to reflect and share with us as you, as you um, <coughs> desire um, the kinds of, of um, value that might be measured in your context and the methods and have a chance for, for us to have some interaction on and, and advice perhaps on, on methods. So we, we will not, I will not talk at you for the entire hour and a half. I will talk at you for, for a good hour probably, but uh, we'll have some time, some time for that. Um, Libraries have been, you know, traditionally libraries measured inputs, right? You measured how many things you, you brought in, how many things that were cataloged, how, what size of collection, that all kind of inputs. And we assumed that by measuring inputs that we were demonstrating value. Um, we were certainly demonstrating activity. You know, we were busy doing a lot of collection development and cataloging, but we didn't necessarily demonstrate overall value. It was a kind of implied value. We then moved to the next kind of implied value, and this is still very, uh, inputs and implied values are both valuable, but we didn't spend a lot of time on them in, in lib value because libraries do them well. So you've got the inputs down really well. And, and the standards still ask you to count, you know, size of collection and an active number of workshops offered and all of that. So we, we know how to do that. We also, in the last decade or so, have gotten really good at the implied value of use. So the next level after inputs is then implied value through use. And what I mean is we do things like we look at download for e-collections. It's really good because we can we can get since counter has been around for 11 years now we can we can count how many times people download things from our e-collections so we're really good at counting downloads as a proxy for use and a proxy for value from e-collections we we also do that with turnstile counts you know number of people that come into the building that's an implied value we we assume that because they come into the building, they are getting value from it. We assume because they're downloading, they're getting value from it. That's better than inputs, but it still leaves a lot to be desired. And let me, let me show you some of the downside, perhaps, of implied value. So this is University of Tennessee downloads um, from uh, 04 to 10. And we see this, you know, very steady increase, like a huge increase. Man, we got really valuable in 910. Well, part of it is we got better at counting. Um, more publishers um, adhered to the counter project counter standards, so we, so we were able to uh, to count better. But also, there was an indeed there was an increase in e-collection use. Part of this it was reaction to decrease in print use. Um, E-preferred policies began to come in um, 
and, and at universities all over. And so we were, the library in a sense was driving this by driving people to the E, but also we were saving people time in finding so they were able to download more. Uh, so, so huge. So, so we're saying, okay, our value is increasing. So what happens here in 11? Does the library have less value? Look, the number of downloads went down. Even if we normalize this by size of student and faculty, it still goes down because the number of students didn't decrease at that time. So, um, so you can, can do that. If you have a decrease in faculty or students, you, you might want to do that. But it doesn't mean, I, I, would, I would maintain that our value didn't decrease because the number of, of downloads went down. So we have to be very careful on those kinds of implied values. They are easy to collect. They show a nice kind of trend. You use them for other purposes. If you break this down by um, what's being used, of course it can be used for collection decisions and negotiating licenses and lots of other things. But for demonstrating value, um, it does show a trend, but it doesn't, you, know, you can't use that only as a proxy. Um, well, the other thing it doesn't show, implied value, whether it's people coming into the building or downloads or use of collections, it doesn't show what they did with it. It doesn't show the value to their work by downloading all these things. Did, were they better students? Were they, did they write more articles as faculty? It doesn't show outcomes. It doesn't show what they did with it. Indeed, it doesn't even show if they really re read it. <laughs> we assume a download equals a read. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe not. Um, but it certainly doesn't show the next step. So still valuable as background, but we need to go a step further. And, and indeed, um, ACRL reached that same conclusion, and the ACRL standards do emphasize outcomes. And most educational institutions now really are emphasizing measuring outcomes. Uh, academic departments now have to show, you know, what did students learn? Not just how many classes did you make available to them, but what did they learn in the class? Not just how many resources did they download or do you have but what did they do with it and how did that help them be a better student, be a better faculty member, whatever. So that's kind of the next, the next level and that's where our focus was. So the whole idea of these projects is going beyond this implied value, whether it's inputs or outputs, um, and to look at purpose of use and how that varies, to look at outcomes of use, and also, we did look at return on investment, and I'll talk to you about different, some of the negatives and positives of re return on investment, so we'll talk about return on investment. Again, it is contextual. Every institution needs to, to put together a plan and make a decision of what kinds of measures of value make sense in your institution. And to be honest, part of that has to do with who your, who your funders are and uh, and, and your provost, for example, what background and what speaks to him or her. So I'll talk about that a little bit too. So I want to I want to back up and talk about types of values that drove a lot of our work. And we went back to look at the um, economist Fritz Mockluff, who was quite active in the 60s and 70s, and looked at value in the information context, and that helped drive some of our work. And, and he talks about two types of value in the information context um, out of the economics um, uh, background. So the first um, that we looked at is this purchase or exchange value. That is what, what one is willing to pay for information and money and or time. In the academic context, it's the time that's really relevant. And in the library context, it's really the time. It's exchange value. What are, how are students and faculty spending their time interacting with library products and services? And that's a kind of value. Um, we don't normally ask them to pay, well you ask students to pay tuition, but you don't ask faculty members to pay for access, and so we're not, we're not really looking at that kind of purchase. It's not like buying a, you know, an ice cream or something. So it's really exchange value. 
this, the second kind of value uh, that's, that's relevant that, that we looked at here was this use value, which is also outcome. That is, what are the consequences derived from reading or using the information? And this is really key, and this, of course, is difficult. The further downstream you go in this, the more difficult it gets to measure. Easy to measure input, implied value now is, is easier, but it gets more difficult as you go down. So this um, favorable consequences is something that we, we looked at uh, in, in quite an uh, amount of depth. Other um, categories, uh, Syracuse University was a partner on this project. Uh, Bruce Kingma, who is in the iSchool there, was also in the provost's office uh, uh, while he was working with us, so it gave us that nice combination of researcher, information scientist, and administrator, university administrator, worked with us. And he looked at this idea of comprehensive value of the library and different categories. So one, one category that we need to measure is what he calls economic or private value. What is the value to an individual? And, and again, that would overlap with exchange value. What am I getting from having the library classes, from having the library collections, from having the library physical facilities? What is the value to me as an individual, whether I'm a student or a faculty, and how do I measure that? So that's one level, looking at individuals and how that helps them be better at what they do. Um, the second is the public or social value. What is the value of the institution, uh, value to the institution of the library? How, and, and, and you can look at things here like special collections. How does that help with um, notoriety or, or um, uh, how people perceive this institution? or collections, or physical facilities, a beautiful building. What does that do in terms of the institution? How does that help attract faculty? How does that help with rankings? How does that help that, that in the institutional mission? And we'll come back to this again and again, of course, that the institutional mission tying the, the library into that is really important. So that's the social or public value. So there's values to the individual, people that you serve, your stakeholders, but there's also value to the, to the institution. And then and, and Bruce added a, another kind of value, which is one we hadn't thought about before, but, but as we looked at things, which was kind of interesting, and I'll show you how, what some of his thinking was. And that's the external or environmental value. That is, libraries have decreased print collections and increased e-collections, of course, tremendously. And there may be a savings there that we hadn't even thought of. And that's that environmental savings. How does the library's e-only or e-preferred policy, how does that contribute to environmental savings? That is, uh, faculty not having to, to travel to the library, access from wherever they are, wherever they're working, what kinds of savings is, is that? So, so um, he helped demonstrate that at Syracuse that even if the use by faculty of the physical building has gone down. There is a value of the fact they don't have to physically visit the building. That's an environmental value. So these are all kinds of measures of value, if you will, um, and, and kind of, um, as I say, drove, drove some of our thinking, how can we come up with methods that might test, test these? Um, and so that, that, that led to this to the Live Value Project, um, value outcome comes in return on investment of academic libraries. It has been taken over by ARL, and you, you can find ARL uh, has a has a website for it. Um, it's branded with the ARL um, uh, logos and things. Um, other partners um, besides ARL, I mentioned Institute Museum and Library Services, of course, University of Tennessee, Syracuse, uh, University of Illinois, in the UK, JISC Collections. Um, and then these were the original partners, but then we had, as I say, a number of universities, um, uh, Colorado, um, University of Colorado, uh, Seton Hall, I'm, if I start listing them, I'm going to forget some, but we, we had a lot of, of universities that came in to test a particular method, and, and you'll see some of their results. So it's been, been widely used. The idea, again, for the project is 
that it requires multiple institutions working together to test different methods. It requires multiple methods in any institution. It, it, measuring assessment isn't just one method. You're gonna, it, it requires multiple methods. It requires looking at multiple values and every service and every stakeholder. What it means is deconstructing. The library as a whole has, has a value, but to get to that value as a whole, you've got to look at the pieces. And, and one, of, one of our teams looked at, the, the comprehensive value team um, was uh, Syracuse and Bryant University, a small, small um, business-focused um, university in um, Rhode Island. And at Bryant, they broke, they broke down every single service the library offered, and Drexel was also a partner in that. And um, they came up with 94, that team came up with 94 separate things that the library does, separate services. And each one has a cost, but each one also has a value. So that's, that's the end degree. Most people don't go to that <laughs> extreme uh, to break it down that far. But certainly there are, you know, there is this accumulated value you really have to look at the pieces. And the value of students is going to be measured differently than the value of faculty. So it is, is a process. And one thing that has happened because of this, you may have noticed that there's a lot of job openings for assessment librarians. <laughs> now, uh, people that will kind of coordinate these efforts. So. Um, as I mentioned, we worked in teams. We had, we had lots of different uh, teams with lots of partners, and you'll find results from all of these. Um, the, um, I, I'll give you some examples from all of them, but most of my, my examples will come from the collections and reading team um, and the return on investment, because those were the two teams I was working on. But we had we looked at value of teaching uh, and, and learning. We looked at value of the information commons and space, uh, value of digitized special collections, um, e-books, and, and lots of things. We also created a bibliography which is still available so if you want to see um, the, uh, what others have done as well. And then tools and, and ARL is responsible for, for making those tools available so you can see those. Um, so I want to focus um, beyond the applied value and look at four, four uh, indicators of value today four methods of looking at, at value, and then, um, and then uh, go back and let you, you look at your context. So first, I want to talk about that exchange value. So um, one of the things in the collections area we looked at for exchange value is we needed to look at how much time academics, and we looked at graduate students, students, and faculty each separately. I've just brought to you the faculty here today, but the reports are available for the students as well, as well. How much time they spend interacting with scholarly material, with collections. And so the way we did this, instead of looking at just downloads, okay, we've got downloads, we wanted to look at print and electronic. We wanted to look at faculty separate from, from students. We wanted to you know, look at the whole. So we used surveys. And surveys, we replicated some surveys we had done for many years but, so we could compare over time. But we wanted to look at in-depth with a survey. Now, I have to say that download data is really good um, once a year. Surveys once a year is too much. <laughs> People do get survey fatigue. So if you're going to get this in-depth look at your organization, you need to have a plan that every three years or however often maybe you do live cloud all you participate you know kind of um, interleaving those so so you can't you can't do these all the time you can you can do things like focus groups you can do um, do other methods but surveys are useful every say every three years so what we did in the surveys is we did two kinds of things one is we looked at asked people about their behavior um, and the other is we asked them to focus on a critical incident of last use of material, so that we would be able to look at um, we'd be able to look at outcomes. Critical incident lets us look at outcomes. What did you do with that reading? How did it help you or not? As well as overall amounts. And so we have those two kinds of things. 
We looked at reading from the library and from other sources. We wanted to look at how the library is stacked up against the competition. If I get it from somewhere else, do I have different opinions than if I get it from the library? You don't have to do that. The library, uh, some of the ones that replicated just wanted to focus on the readings from the library. And so that's, that's perfectly okay, but again, we wanted to look at where does the library fit into the overall picture. But, but again, that's not, not necessary. So one of the things we asked, and I've, I've got the, this one I've got Australia, US, and UK, but um, most of the time I'll just show you the US numbers. But we asked um, some recollection questions, and one recollection question is how many, uh, how many articles how, uh, did you read in the last month? People don't remember past a month, and even that's pushing it a little bit. So within a short period of time. How many readings did you have from books in the last month? Not how many books did you read, how many readings from books. So going beyond the table of contents, if you read one paragraph, we count that as a reading from a book because it still has value. Okay, so readings from books. It might be readings, it might be you know, seven readings from the same book, but different types of readings. We, we then ask them if it was unique. And then other publications, and that would be other websites, um, uh, um, government documents, there's a whole long list of, of other. The, um, and and the, the bottom line is academics read a lot um, every month. Um, on average, about uh, you know, between 25 and, and 22 articles per month, as well as about seven readings from books and, and eight to 10 readings from other, other things. That's a lot, and we say for work-related work purposes. So scholarly material, there's a lot of reading going on. Um, that represents a huge investment in time. So the next thing we did is we asked for that focus on the last item you read and tell us how of each of those categories and how much time did you spend on that reading. That gives us a sample of time that we can do average time spent on reading. Okay, so if you take all of those readings and you take the time, average time and you can come up with a total time. And that's a huge investment of time. They're making a decision. They're exchanging their time for interacting with these materials that you provide. Um, now, we asked about all readings. We needed to know what percent of those readings came from the library to look at the value of the library compared to the value of other sources. Again, you might want to just focus on readings from library collections. In the US, about, this is just now articles, about half, a little over half, 55%, of the article readings came from the library collection. It's higher in the UK, it's about two thirds. So between two thirds and a half of readings they know come from the library. There's a whole lot of other things in here that came from the library and they don't know it. Um, the better, ironically, the better libraries get in setting up systems, the more difficult it is <laughs> For the reader to know where that is coming from. You have a link resolver, they go, they're sitting in their office, uh, they go to Google Scholar, they get an article, they say, I got it from a website. When they really got it from the library collection. Or their colleagues sent them something that they downloaded from the library and they shared. We have a project right now where we're looking at how much sharing is going on. What's the real amount of reading? If I put it into a collaborative workspace, then I don't count it in my downloads. I got it from the library, I downloaded it once, then I shared it with 10 other people. So that item from the library really was used 10 times, not once, but we only counted it once, because we only downloaded once. So, so this is a very conservative estimate. And this is a problem, again, with relying on download figures because people don't, don't realize that they don't capture. So conservatively half of the readings from the library actually probably a lot more. However, another cautionary note is that um, readings from websites and other sources have increased in the last decade, which means people are, are getting things from a wider variety, more open access journals, for example, and so that the library is not the only 
the only game in town when it comes to providing access and that will increasingly be true so again a little bit of a cautionary tale but the method will work whether you're using it from for journal collections or other kinds of, of collection okay um, just because they're reading from the library between two-thirds and a half of readings from the library doesn't mean they're reading in the library so we asked about for that last reading where were you when you read it okay half of them were from the library's e collector library's collection mostly e but only two percent were read in the library of faculty not surprising <laughs> you knew that if you work in the library um, but this is an example of that environmental value or that time savings value people exchange exchange value is kind of a tricky thing because you want to save the readers time you save them time in finding and locating but but they're also but the value of the time they spend interacting with the sources has increased so so they're you're saving time on one end so that they can spend more valuable time reading and understanding and most of the reading is going on in office or lab um, in the uh, uh, some while traveling and other but mostly at, at home it's a little hard to see that the top section there is home you have access to the to all these slides so, um, so the top top section is home the biggest section is office or lab so even though half of the readings from the library most of them not in the library so again um, the value here is two twofold saving people's time and that environmental value of e-collection so it's a, a direct value of e i don't have to be in the library um, if you put those things together time spent reading um, and reading from the library then we calculated average number of readings per month um, from the library times 12 we assume they're reading 12 months out of the year if you don't believe that then do it times 9 or times 10 or give them a vacation if you like um, but we just did it times 12 okay so um, but it can be done anyway um, times number of readings and you get to and we broke it down into eight hour work days so it's it's about it's between 20 and 30 eight hour work days each year reading materials that come from the library and again you can take it the next step you can then calculate what the dollar value of that is because you can take average salaries and again at Bryant and Syracuse we did that we and, and Drexel we actually looked at what that came out in terms of dollar value they it was worth this much if you want to do return on investment for that this is this much but but you can also just say they spend a lot of time interacting with library materials which is a kind of exchange value now what that doesn't show is what they did with it okay they spent their time they spent a lot of their time that's exchange value but what happened what's the use value or the outcomes of that and that's the next stage which again as you go deeper each stage becomes a bit more labor intensive and a bit more difficult but probably more valuable and something you want to do every three to five years probably so use value and outcomes we asked by using critical incident in, in surveys we're able to look to ask questions like for the last and let's just say article for the last article you read and it could be the last article you read from the library um, what was the purpose of the reading why were you why were you doing it and research this is Australia UK US the top um, for all of them is for research and or writing so for academics um, at, uh, faculty the, the number one purpose of reading scholarly articles is for research and writing not surprisingly um, current awareness or my personal education was the next and then others uh, or teaching I'm sorry teaching is next and then current awareness and others so the next big big um, bigger um, the, the white section is um, is for teaching so research writing and teaching are the main purposes of, of reading articles current awareness or education the next we ask about purpose because this is where you begin to tie the value into the mission so the mission of 
your university, whatever it might be, is probably has to do with research, uh, publication, and teaching. Those are, those are the main kinds of parts of the mission. And so the demonstrating the readings that come, or the value of the collections or the services of the library to support the research, or writing, and teaching missions are particularly important. And that is actually where the readings from libraries uh, shine. So then we ask, then we look at where was the article by purpose. And so let, let me talk you through this a little. Um, a majority of, write, of readings um, from, for the purpose of research and teaching, and slight majority for current awareness come from the libraries, but mostly research and teaching. So if you look at other purposes, the library has less of their contribution. People are reading to just kind of, to, to keep up with what's going on in my field. A lot of that comes from personal subscriptions still. Or it comes from, um, you know, from other sources, or a colleague sent me something. But the library is the main source of readings for research and teaching. And so the, the real value, I guess, or the, the, the main value of, the, of those collections are for the research and teaching, much more than others. We also, to look at outcomes, there is another way to look at outcomes, and, and it's, a, it's a way you can do in focus groups, you can do in interviews, or you can do in surveys, but you have to ask people. You can't get it automatically, so you need to ask, but it's a, it's a more qualitative way, and that is to ask them, what, what happened as a result of this reading? So here's the last thing you read, or the last thing you read from the library, what did you do with it? Because you could go, you're asking somebody to remember something in the past, and what's happening in the future, or what do you plan to do with it? So we, we ask about outcomes. And the number one um, outcome of readings is to inspire new thinking or ideas. Um, most people said that was their number one uh, purpose or outcome from reading. It helped me get new ideas. It helped me think in new ways. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, that ties very directly into the mission of most, most universities, that I am providing material that helps move forward ideas and thinking, that our, our materials have a direct result in that. Um, the second and third uh, most common answers, and people could take pick more than one or add, add their own, um, to improve the principal purpose. So we know what the purpose was. It was teaching, research, current awareness, other. And this reading helped improve the principal purpose. Um, it helped me write a better article. It helped me teach a better class. It helped me do a better research project. And again, the support, you can the outcomes can be directly, directly tied then. The third was, it helped me change the focus. So it, I narrowed or broadened or changed the focus of the purpose. So I was writing, and, it, and by reading this, it helped me change. And then there's a whole bunch of other purposes or outcomes, if you will, um, from reading. It helped me resolve technical problems. You know, I could see a picture of a, of, um, a machine that I have in my laboratory, and I could see that I, I needed to change the, or it described the way something was calibrated, and I need to change my calibration. Or it helped me save time, let me do my work faster, um, or um, provided in collaboration or joint research. When you're looking at outcomes from use of your collections, by the way, you cannot just look at positive. We gave people a long list of choices and had them check all and apply. You can also, as I say, do it in focus groups, more qualitative, but you also have to be open to negatives. And there were actually negative choices. They just didn't show up in the top 10. Uh, the number one negative is it wasted my time. And a certain percent of readings are gonna do that. I read it and it didn't do anything. It was not what I thought it was. It was indexed wrong, or it had a misleading title, or whatever. Um, we did find, it's a very small percent of readings, but readings that come from sources other than the library were more likely to waste time. So that's something that might be worth looking into, but, uh, but it's, it is a small percent of readings. 
somebody said to me once when i was explaining you know talking about you know such a small percent um had a negative uh, or wasted time somebody said well i wouldn't have wasted any more of my time filling out your survey if that reading had wasted my time to begin with so maybe we missed some of those i don't know but outcomes again don't just think quantitatively think qualitatively because an outcome can be something that transforms a purpose that supports the university mission that helps somebody do something better and it can be it can be told in stories or it can be told in a quantitative way let me let me switch over here to return on investment which is really a quantitative way um, in, in its strict sense and somewhat controversial I think the things I've been talking about before are not controversial. They're things that many of you are doing or have been doing or starting to do if you haven't been. Um, there are things that are understandable to everybody. Um, but there are some instances, and in, in depending again on, on your administration, where they're saying, I've spent this much on the library. How much does it contribute to the university's bottom line? Um, I hope for your sake you don't have <laughs> administration that asks that, but, but, but sometimes that is the case. You know, what are you doing to bring in income? I, see, I remember, um, luckily he has since left the University of Tennessee, but I do remember a provost one time standing up and saying, I, I put more and more money into the library and I get nothing out of it. Which of course is a huge impetus for doing assessment and demonstrating value. But he, but that's also an impetus if you have somebody who thinks like that of saying, okay, what monetarily are you getting out of it? One monetary way is to take the exchange value, the next step, and look at the salaries of the people and how much time. But the next, the other is return on investment. So let's look at that. So return on investment in its strict sense is a quantitative measure um, it is a ratio of the value returned to the institution for each monetary unit invested in the library so for every dollar um, spent on the library the university received this many dollars in return and i have um, euros and pounds there because we did this and actually I could have had yen there and a few other monetary units but we did this all over the world it was a, a pressure felt all over the world to show that the library was not just sitting there being a money suck <laughs> that it also contributed to faculty who were bringing and students who were bringing, bringing money in so this idea for every dollar what does the university get and, and what we did is, again, we looked at collections. Um, you, can, you can look at other things, but we looked at how to, uh, to demonstrate that library collections contribute to income generating activities. Now, you can immediately see some of the problems. You know, what are the income generating activities of the university? Grants are the easiest. Grants coming in is the easiest. We took the easiest way out. Okay. Um, tuition might be another. This is really controversial, and I'll tell you, if you don't want to go there, don't go there, <laughs> okay? Um, but, but if it's something that speaks to your administration, to your library, if you are working in a, um, if you're in the engineering library and your engineering department is bringing in millions and millions of dollars of grants, you want to show the contribution of the library to that. If the library wasn't there, you know what it would be more difficult so that that's the idea okay so as i said we tested this one throughout the world uh, nine institution in eight eight countries and we looked at uh, just grants and um, the way it was done is we looked at we went to faculty so we did multiple methods we um we did surveys and, uh, and interviews with faculty we did interviews with uh, Office of Research Administrators and University Administrators, Provosts and, and Chancellors. Um, we looked at grant proposals that were submitted and we looked at grants that were generated and received. So we had a lot of data, very intense 
uh, data gathering, the Office of Research was a partner in each of these institutions, as well as the administration. Um, when we asked the faculty, we, we asked the faculty about um, how many grant proposals they submitted, how many grants they had received within the last 10 years, the dollar amount of those grants. Then we asked how many citations were in those grant proposals, and we asked them to rate how important they thought their literature review and the citations were to the, to the grant application, so there was a, you know, they thought it contributed maybe, you know, 50% of the value. And then we asked how important the library was in providing access to those materials. This is a roundabout kind of complicated thing. It's all been documented, so if you're interested in that, I will, can point you to the, to the documentation, because it's a, you know, the formula gets a little complicated. Um, then we looked at the percent of citations in the grants that came from the library, that the library had access to. Okay. And then, the, of the proposals that were funded, and then you divide that all by the library budget. It could be divided by the library's collection budget, or it could be divided by the library total budget. Okay. You with me? <laughs> it's a little complicated. Uh, yeah, it, but it's the idea of grants are one income return. And the library is one output. Library costs money. The library collections cost money. Grants bring money in. What is the role of the library? So we know in a qualitative sense, because we ask the faculty what they think, but we also want to know in a dollar. Can we attribute the libraries having the collection based on the, the faculty's expertise as helping improve success? Now, there is a, you know, there's a logical leap there you have to make that, that they wouldn't have had access um, if, if the library wasn't there. Okay, so that's all the caveats. Again, this has been well documented and well discussed and some people really hate it, by the way. <laughs> I don't know. Um, and some people really like it. So we, we, this, has been, this has been interesting uh, presenting this. So okay, here's, here we go, return on investment grant. So these nine universities, we had three bands. We had the band of institutions where the ROI for grants was huge, 13 to 15 to one. That is for every dollar spent on the library's collection, the library participated in bringing back $15 by having, helping those proposals succeed. The library could claim that, okay. Um, with again, with the faculty back. These, this band that were in the high range, and by the way, they were kind of scattered all over the world, tended to be research intensive organizations where research was their main focus. They were doing lots of grants and focused on science, technology, and medicine. Okay. So that very, very high in that area. The next band, which is where most of them fit, most of the universities like the University of Tennessee, University of Illinois, that have a combination of uh, science, medicine, social science, humanities, and kind of a, a mix, lots of undergraduate students, um, whereas the top tier, not so many undergraduate students. Um, they do research and teaching. Most of them, it was about 1.3 1, 1 to 1 to 5 to 1. Okay. So that, you know, that, that the library is a good, that helps contribute to the grants process is what we're saying that the library is a factor in that one part of your mission. And then there, are, there was a band that was under one-to-one. -one. And, and, and those folks, I don't think I would advise using <laughs> this method. Um, those are those that are really focused on teaching. They also do research. They're smaller. They don't bring in a lot of grants. And looking at grants was probably not the best way to measure return on investment because it was under one-to-one. -one. They're spending more on collections than they're bringing in in grants. It doesn't mean that the collections don't have other types of value, but the value of grants was not, was not the one. So, so then, then we step back and say, why does the grants return on investment vary so much? Well, first of all, return on investment, any kind of return on investment, if you're gonna do, you need to think about the institutional mission. If your institutional mission is primarily teaching, then don't do return on investment for grants. 
um, you might do um, you know a return on investment in terms of, um, of student success or something. Um, if you're if you if you're a humanities focused campus and your special collections are huge, return on investment special collections can be done in do with donations. We had someone like a special collections library that said, you know, we bring in, we help by the visibility of our special collections and by people donating to our special collections. We bring in millions every year. That doesn't get counted. It counts, gets counted in development. It doesn't get counted in the library, and yet the library is helping bring that in. So that might be the return on investment for a humanities or special collections focus institution. Again, research institutes or institutions have very large grants. If it was a teaching university, then uh, the, the grants were smaller, smaller in dollars, and this is really focusing on dollars. Um, it depends, um, return on investment depends on government funding, again, looking at across, uh, in a Chinese, one of the Chinese universities, they didn't count them as grants, but the, unit, but the government was providing a certain amount of, of dollars for research, so it, it kind of falls apart there. And again, you, you want to be cautious. If you do decide to do return on investment, do it for your institution. Do not compare it to the to another institution. You know, like we're we're better at our life than they are is not is not a good idea because it really is dependent on the on the organization, the institution. So it can have value if you have, especially if you have a provost who says, "I'm spending money on you, and you're not bringing any money in." So there are other things. You know, think about what some of those other things are. Because return on investment in the less strict sense is absolutely valuable. Return on investment, what you want to do is you want to demonstrate that the library brings value of all types to all of your stakeholders. That your collections serve your various stakeholders. That your services serve your, your various stakeholders. And you make a contribution to the community. Um, the um, the idea that that sometimes you have to put a dollar amount on it depending on who your audience is, but you don't always have to put a dollar amount on return on investment. So you, maybe you put return on investment with a you know baby R or put it in quotes, <laughs> but it's this idea that we have a return on your investment. We are creating better students. We are creating uh, better faculty. Um, some of the things that have happened from this and the other, other teams have looked at student retention. What is the role of the library in helping students stay? Which can have a dollar value if you, if you need to do it because you, you, know, you can look at tuition dollars. It can also have a societal value, helping students not drop out. And to do this, we worked with, um, we worked with the Student Success Center and looked at students' exit interviews of students who did drop out, and then we also, and their patterns of library use versus the students who graduated within six years and their patterns of library use. And there is a relationship. The students who use the library more are, are less, students who, who graduate use the library more within their first two years. It, cause and effect, hard to say, but, but there, is a, there is that kind of relationship. Maybe it's because they feel at home, um, the physical, they feel a place. We did find out that students who dropped out, the number one reason at Tennessee why they dropped out is they, did, they felt that they didn't belong. They felt they didn't have a place to go. So there, the library as place, as gathering place, becomes really important, library spaces and the information comes. Okay, so think broadly in return investment. I'd be glad to talk about it some more if you're interested, but um, I want to give you a chance to, to do a little work today, too. So um, that leads kind of the next thing, this value of all types, um, to supporting success. Because if we tie the library value to the mission of the, of the university, um, supporting success, so helping students retain students, helping students succeed, Helping the successful faculty, showing that successful faculty use the library more. These are kinds of things that support support and, and enable success. Um, some of you may have seen the work done in, at the University of Huddersfield in the United Kingdom. They have done more than anybody in the world to link, to support, to demonstrate supporting student success. 
They do things we probably cannot do in the U.S. They, they, um, they, uh, student, they can they can tie the student ID card every time the student goes in to the building and when they and how long they're there and when they go out. And they've been able to look at how many materials they use and then they compare that to the students' grades. I mean that I I'd love to be able to do that. I don't think I'd ever get to, through the institutional review board. Um, but if you could do it, you know, it's, and they do show that students who students who who visit the physical facility more, and students who use more library materials do do better in school. It supports success. Again, we don't know cause and effect, but we do know that it supports success. Um, they did find out that students who visit the library more often after midnight um, at the end of the term don't do as well as others, however. So they, they, they're they keeping track of when the students are going. These are the last minute people, right? So it's, it's kind of interesting. If you have not seen the Huddersfield uh, studies, they're very interesting. But, um, so, but, but there are ways that you can measure without, without uh, um, violating student uh, privacy, perhaps, that we can show that support success. And one way is interviews or focus groups. So we do a lot of interviews, focus groups, um, to, to find out, you know, what is, what is the value of our collections? What is the value of our services? It can be with students, the value of the space. Um, it can be before and after, if you're doing a renovation or, you know, you, you've added a new, new um, service. Um, and so from the faculty, we, we, we get lots of comments like e-access is essential for scientific writing. So, so that, that e-access, I'm, yes, I'm spending a lot of money on my e-collections, uh, e but e-access is essential. And here are some, some faces and some people who show that. I support the success of my faculty or my students. I could not do the kind of research or teaching I do without these resources. I just couldn't do it. Um, there, there was another uh, person who said, I would leave this university in a minute if we didn't have the library we have. You know those kinds of those kinds of quotes and stories are gold. Those are good um, because you can show that this is a successful faculty you know, faculty member, and this is this is how they're feeling. The provosts at the nine that we interviewed told us that attracting and retaining high quality faculty is one of the most important things they look to the library to do. So when a library member says, "I'd leave this university in a minute if we didn't have a good library," that speaks immediately to that provost, that, that we are, the library is keeping the stars there, keeping the good people there. That, was, that meant a lot to that particular provost. Um, and scholar, this person's scholarly articles are the lifeblood of all we do. We've got thousands and thousands of these. We can, we can you know, use them in, in many ways. There's also quotes, again, that you, you can't just look at the positive. Of course, whenever you are assessing, you have to be willing to take uh, the negative and, and look at ways to improve. So a good way to, to uh, portray an assessment package is here are areas we can improve. So here's what we do well, this is why it's important, this is the outcomes and value of what we do. This is how our value proposition can be increased. You don't have the materials I want. I, your, your hours are not, when I need to get in there, your hours are too slow. Whatever. These are ways to increase the value proposition, so that, that needs to be there as well. Um, we looked at it quantitatively, too. So there's another way to look at supporting success, and, and looking at the, the surveys that we did of reading, we looked at, um, we also asked some demographic questions of faculty, have you received an award in the last two years? Um, so we just took the people who received an award and the people who didn't receive an award. And the people who received award read more articles on average than the people who didn't. Book readings, not statistically significantly different, about the same. Um, other publications reading more. People, the successful people read more. Again, it's supporting success. I'm not saying if you read more, you will be a star. <laughs> but I'm saying that if you are a star, you read more. Okay. So it is supporting success. Um, prolific, we also looked at prolific academics as defined by amount of publication, those who publish a zero to two, three to 10, 11 plus um, publications in the last two years, and um, those who you can see that increase.
increase. Again, reading more, more articles, um, uh, statistically significantly more articles for the more prolific. Not, again, not surprising, but you don't always demonstrate it and showing that we are, again, supporting success. Now, we took all of that and we created what we're calling a portrait of a successful academic. At one of the universities participating, the provost is a classicist. She said, okay, the numbers are interesting, but I don't really care about numbers so much. And, but she cared about people. She cared about people, and so a persona really spoke to her. It's based on numbers, but it puts a face on it. And so what we did is we took that segment. I just showed you in graphs. For graphs, you know, that for her they weren't so meaningful. This was more meaningful. We took segment of people who had won an award in the last two years, had published four or more items, so that was the top quartile of the faculty, and we looked at them, we compared their reading characteristics and their use of the library with the others, the other three quarters. And so this is what we call portrait of success. So we found out that this successful person, and you can do the same with graduate students there, but this successful person reads more of everything. They spend more time per book and other readings. They use the library, they rely on the library more than others for articles. They do not rely on the article, however, for books and other publications as much. They are buying their own books or they're being given them by publishers. If they're very successful, publishers are sending them books. It's interesting, the percent of readings of faculty of ebooks is still really low. Most of the readings, it's, it's a very small percent for faculty, most of the readings are still print and it's print that they pull off their own shelf. But um, it's going up. Um, they are, um, they do, we also ask them questions about social media use, and they do, they are occasional users and creators of social media of various kinds for work-related purposes. We, we only, we don't care what people do on their, for their social life, we only ask about work-related purposes. So this is a kind of a portrait of success. You can, you can skew this more to the library, you can talk about how the library, what the library does um, to, to um, help this person, but certainly that they are a, a big reader and, they, and they're using them, they're relying on the library for, those, for, um, for article reading, helping support success. Again, with students, again, the Huddersfield, we could do a persona of the successful, the student who graduates with a timely manner, whose grades are higher, if you can get that, they, that they are, they're more likely to use the library, um, and they interact more with the materials from the library. Okay, let me, um, let me end my part here and then we'll, we'll go into some questions and then some time for you to, to work on some things. But um, just some final thoughts on measuring value. And I gave you, you know, I gave you the top line, whirlwind. There's lots written about this. So um, do feel free to ask me questions, but go and, go and look at the things if you're interested in. Again, what you measure, each one of you may have a different plan to measure, measure what is most important to your university, to your college, um, what, what tied to the, to the mission. Um, we really need to focus on the outcomes. How does the library contribute to success? How does the library make people better faculty? How does the library make people better students? Whether it's, you know, the students attended a, a workshop done by the library and they're, you know, those kinds of things. It doesn't have to be collections. And it shouldn't be collections because collections are problematic. Tying all your value to collections in an open access world, ten years from now you don't, you know, you don't want to do that. So it needs to be focused on things other than collections. Um, qualitative, uh, quantitative data. You, if, you, if you're going to do return, strict return on investment or trends, the quantitative data is important. Make a plan for for collecting the quantitative data. It is it is important. Uh, qualitative data, however, can tell a story, and sometimes telling those stories are as important. Um, let me give you one more example on that. Uh, the, uh, in our special collections team, they, they were collecting quantitative data, the digitized photo collections of how many people were using them and where the people were coming from. Okay, so we knew that, we knew they were scattered all over. Okay, but the use isn't really high. So they began to do, they did a, a pop-up and asked, would you be willing to be interviewed? 
and, and several people came back and said they would. And they found that one of the uses, of a fairly low number of use, so it wouldn't look like they were that valuable if you were just tying amount of use to the cost of digitizing all this historical stuff. But one of the people who agreed to be interviewed for the um, digital photo archives of the Great Smoky Mountain National Park from before it was a national park to the present um, was the producer, was, was Ken Burns, who was doing a um, uh, national park. You may remember a couple years ago there was this national park. And, and the interview was, I couldn't, I couldn't have done the part on the Smoky Mountains if it wasn't for this digital archive. These are materials that we didn't know existed, first of all. If they'd known they existed, maybe they could have traveled and, and done them. We didn't know existed. We found out they existed. We used them. It, you know, it, it added money to the economy if you want to look at money, but it gave prestige. It gave uh, acknowledgment. It was one person's use but the value was very high. And so the best way to convey that, again, is in a story. It is, it is a story that's meaningful to donors <laughs> and meaningful to, to administrators, that, that sometimes qualitative is really more important than quantitative because it tells that story of the value of use. Numbers of uses are not the only kind of value. Sometimes there's a single use that's of a high value. And, and that kind of wraps all of this up to the idea that no one method stands alone. You really have to have a plan for multiple methods, um, in t including quantitative, qualitative, um, and including uh, all different kinds of value to really show the value of the library. Did I wish we didn't have to do it? Maybe, um, but we do um, in, in this kind of a climate of today, but also I think it will help drive better library services. So in the long run, it actually has lots of, of purposes and, and good that comes out of, of assessment. So let me, let me just conclude with that, that a plan, um, a, an assessment plan looks at things over time, looks at multiple methods, does, that ties to stakeholders. What is the value to the undergraduate student, first two-year undergraduate student? the value to the upper division undergraduate students, the value to master's students, the value to doctoral students, the value to research faculty, the value to teaching faculty, the value to faculty who both do both. All of those kinds of things can help draw this picture. It's something that takes effort. It's not something you just do once and forget. It's not something you do every year. It's really a long-term a long term kind of plan that helps, helps improve services as well as demonstrate value. Um, so thank you. And um, for further information, the, um, I think in the handouts that, or that were sent to you, I had the wrong URL because I gave the UT URL. ARL has now taken this over. So the libvalue.org is the ARL um, a a URL. So that's, that's where it really should be. That's what's keeping it up. So it's libvalue.org uh, run, by, run by ARL. And if you're not um, if you're not part of the ARL Assess listserv, I would also recommend that lively list. You don't have to be an ARL library to belong. Um, ARL runs an assessment conference every two years. Um, if you, even if you can't get to those, um, they they have a um, a lively conversation always going on assessment um, at their at their list. So I would uh, recommend those. And and of course feel feel free to contact me. So thank you. And okay. <laughs> now I'm gonna turn it over to you. We've got a little less than a half hour, but let's let's first take any questions people have. Thank you, Dr. Temper. Si tienen preguntas en español las pueden hacer y tratamos de hacer alguna traducción más o menos entendible. has needs and they don't need to do anything from the library. 
and you know, have me insisting on that. But if I want to put at least one question, can I do something there, like how was the library important for you? Maybe not important, <laughs> how does the library help you achieve your grade, something like that, or should I go more specific? Well, um, and, and that, I think that's really key because students get too much stuff and graduating students. So working with the student exit interviews or student success, that's, that's where it has worked the most. So yeah, usually you have to add one, maybe two questions. Um, it, it depends. If you can add more than one, you can ask something like, you know, how often did you, you know, on, in a typical month, how often did you use the libraries? Um, e-collections or print collections and how often did you visit the library and then you can say what value it was. If you can only ask one, I'd probably go for the quantitative, the qualitative, what, what, how did the library help you while you were a student is probably a good kind of question. If, if you can ask more than one, then you can do quantitative and qualitative. But, um, but to, act, to, to go with the well, to really get meaning from the quantitative, you have to ask more than one question. So, so I think that you know, I think that would be a good good idea. And and yes, it's more successful if it's part of the university's um, overall rather than a separate 